What doesn't kill you makes you stronger Stand a little taller Doesn't mean I'm lonely when I'm alone What doesn't kill you makes you stronger Hi everyone, I'm Allison and this is Kicking Cancer to the Curb. Today you're going to meet my gastroenterologist, Dr. Raina Olson. Hello. Hello. Thank you for inviting us into your home. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's I'm used to being in her office, of course, so this is kind of cool to see where <laughs> she lives, and I like it. So let's start with the definition of gastroenterologist. All right. What What do you do? Basically, it's a study of anything from the mouth to the anus. So as food goes from the mouth and the whole digestion process until it comes out. So all everything that goes right, everything that goes wrong. All right. So everything in the belly region, um, that's another way of thinking of it as well. So someone would go to their general doctor like I did and then whatever, the, whenever there's an issue, they're referred to you. Right. A general doctor is able to identify problems, right. such as rectal bleeding, but if it needs to be looked further into, which oftentimes it does, right. then a gastroenterologist has the skills to go in and see what's going on in there. Did you say gastro... Say it again. Gastroenterologist. Yeah, gastro... I I had to like practice that when I first met her, and I'm like, what? what is that? Like, there's so many syllables to that, and I had to look it up. So I didn't even know, because until you have something, you don't really do that much research. Um, Let's talk colon cancer, which is, you know, my specialty. Um, what are some of the signs? I know you just men mentioned rectal bleeding. What are some other signs that people should look for? Rectal bleeding is a big one, but you only get rectal bleeding if the cancer is near the anus region. So sometimes you can get no rectal bleeding at all, and instead you'll get change of bowel habits where before if you were constipated all the time, now you're more runny, or vice versa, if you're more runny, you're more constipated, or you have a complete change in your bowel habits where your stools come out very skinny and pencil-like. Those are big telltale signs okay. that you may need to look for issues going on in there. Okay, that's really important to know and to, and to acknowledge because I had symptoms for seven months and I diagnosed myself on WebMD and told her <laughs> that I either had um, irritable bowel syndrome or bowel disease, remember? I'm like, I remember that. this is what I have. She's like, okay. Yeah, okay, so. Um, and you know, the one thing that you said that made me a little concerned when you came in mm -hmm. is all your symptoms were relatively new. If it's something that you've had for years and years, I say to myself, Ooh, I know there's nothing serious going on. But if it's something recent and new, okay. it's not going to be IBS. It's not going to be something benign. It's going to be something that needs to be looked into. Once it's looked into and we know everything is good, then you can say, okay, well, maybe it's something benign and not a big deal. But when there's an acute change, right, that's a big deal that needs to be brought to your doctor's attention. Yeah, because I was losing weight and I had the bleeding and I was just, oh, it's this, oh, it's that and ignoring it, which was really just a terrible decision. I mean, none of us think cancer. I can remember the morning that I talked to you saying to my best friend, she's like, have you talked to your doctor? I'm like, you know, we just booked our Madonna tickets, and I'm like, it doesn't matter. I go, it's fine. It's not going to be cancer. I remember saying those words, and like five hours later, I'm phoning her shaking, but we'll get to that. When it comes to colon cancer, does it start with a polyp? Yes, it always starts with a polyp and then grows into cancer. What is the, are the polyps already there? No, the polyps grow um, in the colon. You, everybody has a clean colon to begin with. I mean, okay. you're not born with polyps. Okay. There's something that develop with time. We don't know what causes polyps. We really don't. We don't. We don't know if it's a genetic thing. We don't know if it's a dietary thing. We really don't have that information. If we did, we'd be able to prevent it. It's just something that grows inside, and then if it's a polyp and it's small, it's easily, easily treated. And then as it grows bigger and bigger, it turns into a cancer, and that's whenever you have to start thinking about other treatment modalities, such as surgery or chemo or radiation. 
Right. That's why early detection is key because the smaller those polyps are when you find them, the easier it is to take care of. How do you find the polyps? Colonoscopies. Colonoscopy. Yeah. Colonoscopy is the way you find them. But you know, in your situation, you didn't really have a fair chance of that because typically you start screening for colon cancer at the age of 50. Right. You were less than 50. I was like 20. <laughs> well, you were 20. <laughs> you were a couple older. This last year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's true. So you're saying it's very rare to get colorectal cancer at a, a, a under 50. Without a family history, yeah. it's very rare. So that's why listening to the symptoms that your body is showing you is crucial. Right. Typically, we screen patients when they're 50, and then if they have a family history, we do it at 40 or 10 years before their first degree relative was diagnosed. Okay. That's the typical screening modality. So my children will start at like 30, 35. How 10 years were, before. 10 years before. Yeah. How old were you when you were diagnosed? 44. 44, so they would do it at 30 to 34. Yeah, I'll have them doing it at 20. <laughs> With the colonoscopy, you're saying start at 50, men and women, there's no difference. You know what's so interesting? Colon cancer is the third most common cancer in both men and women. Really? Lung cancer is number one, breast cancer is number two, right. and men it's prostate cancer, and then it's colon cancer, and I don't think people know that. Breast cancer gets so much coverage. It's the sexy one. I know. Yeah. It's so much more important. <laughs> everybody knows about it. And everybody gets their mammograms and people yes. don't miss it. I mean, they yes. mark it on their calendar and they're serious about it. And colon cancer is right there with breast cancer. But for some reason, it just doesn't get the sexy coverage like well, breast cancer does. Definitely. It's not as glamorous. And, you know, you've got the Avon run. You've got uh, Susan G. Komen. Like, the, those started several years before, I mean, awareness, and it's big now. It's like huge, so I'm here to help with the colorectal. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so once a year, um, after 50, there's no difference. Can you, you know, it's not once a year. It's oh, once it's... every 10 years. That's oh. it. Oh. It's that easy. Oh, I'll be going once a year. Yeah. Not forever though. Okay. Even if you have cancer, it's not once a year forever. All right. It's only once a year for the first year, and then the third year, and then the fifth year, and then you're every five years. Then it gets further and further away. Yeah. For those who do not know, like I did not know, what it what is um, what happens with the colonoscopy? It's an outpatient procedure. It is an outpatient procedure. The hardest part, as you know and can yeah. attest to, is the night before you take the preparation, which is basically a cleanse. But in LA, everybody goes and pays all these I people know, to get cleanses anyway, so people are quite used to it. Yeah. You cleanse your entire bowel, which is a day of diarrhea, and then... <laughs> don't leave your house. And it, the solution is very salty. We've changed it, so now it's a little bit easier than when you had it. What is it called? What's like right light or G light or well, something? Well, it's called go lightly. Oh, yeah, go lightly. And that's hardly what you do. You, you don't go lightly. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't. That, you that's a joke. So that's the worst part. Then the day of the procedure, you get an IV, so it's one needle stick to you. Yeah. And then you get the happy juice, and you're in yeah. la-la land yeah. in a twilight sleep. You're not completely out, so you're even able to watch us. I don't know if you were I was out. If you were out, out. Yeah. Most people fall asleep. I'll, I'll be honest yeah. with you. Most people sleep through the whole thing. But there's a small percentage who are able to wake up towards the end and watch what we're doing. And everybody's like, oh, I don't want to see my colon. I don't want to see my colon. And 100% of the time, when patients wake up and see their insides and they're having no pain with it while they're looking and right. they're seeing their insides, their reaction is, don't put me back to sleep. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Okay. And it's not 99%. It's 100%. 100%. Everybody's like, wow. This is the coolest thing. And I'm like, yeah, now you see why I love doing what I do. It is so fun to see the inside of your body. It's so amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty cool. I, I, I miss that. I remember waking up, and I remember lifting my head and looking up and saying something like, all good, doc. And you go, you need to come into the office. I'm like, okay, so everything's good. You're like, yeah, we'll, we'll just come into the office. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And then you, you can't drive home. You have to have somebody pick you up. And then you're, you have to rest for that evening. Yeah. But the next day, you, can, you can't do aerobics or lifting or anything. 
crazy like that for a couple days after, right? Well, just for the day, if we took any polyps out, you can't do anything strenuous because we don't want you to bleed. Yeah. But if we didn't take any polyps out, and when we do take a polyp out, it's like getting a hair trim. You don't feel it. You don't even know that we did it. Right. So it's so easy. And if we go in and we see a polyp, they're right. like little mushroom growths. We just take them out and you're done. Those, those polyps don't turn into colon cancer. So colonoscopy is actually a 100% preventative test. Mm -hmm. We go in and sometimes, you know, and we find cancer, but really the purpose of a colonoscopy is to prevent polyps from turning into cancer because when we see those polyps, take those things out and you have a much lower risk of getting colon cancer. Are they burned out or cut yeah. out? How do you do that? You just pinch them with a biopsy forcep if oh. they're small and just yank them out. And it's so easy to do and it's painless. And if they're larger, then we get a snare, which is like a lasso, and we lasso it off with either some heat or not any heat. Okay. Uh, and just remove them like that. It's so simple to do. And it's, I mean, the whole purpose is to prevent colon cancer. So we go in there, take those out. That way people don't get their colon cancer. And for those of you that are afraid of procedures, I am here to tell you that procedure does not even compare to the pain and suffering you're going to go through if those polyps become cancerous. So it's one day, it's one drink, and you know, you do get the happy juice, which is, that, that's kind of nice. What is that? It's a versed and fentanyl, and it's, it makes you forget if you have any pain during the procedure, oh, yeah. okay. and then the other drug is to take away any pain. People are oftentimes worried that if they get that medication, they're afraid of getting memory loss for long periods of time, mm -hmm. that's not true. I don't oh. know where that concern is coming from, okay. but that's not true. And I tell my patients all the time, one day of drinking that laxative, which is the worst part of the whole test, yes. is worse, it is much better than one day of chemotherapy, right? Yeah. I mean, undergoing that is so easy compared to anything you would have to okay. do if you get scared and prevent and, and not do the test because of fear. Right. Yes, and you, you told me that too. Yes. You did. Um, genetic testing, can they, can they tell whether or not you would have colon cancer from like genetic tests? Or we're not quite there yet. When patients have a strong family history of colon cancer, where they have three people in their family with colon cancer, okay. two of them being first degree relatives and one being diagnosed before the age of 40, then there is genetic testing that those pa patients um, undergo. And the reason they undergo those tests is because they have a genetic deformity which increases their risk of other type of cancers like female cancers or okay. urinary cancers. So those are the ones that actually get the genetic testing uh, to see what other things they should be screened for. Um, and in general, genetic testing just isn't there yet for colon cancer. So the is, is there patient. anything you can do to prevent, you know, with heart, heart disease, they say take an aspirin or drink red wine. I mean, is there anything that you can do besides, oh, I was reading an article about smoking and colon cancer. That, that's a big one. Everybody thinks it's only lungs, but it's... Absolutely. You know, really good health and balanced diet, diet is the best. We say limit your red meat to three times a week. Okay. Go crazy with your fruits and vegetables because high fiber diet helps flush things through. Okay no smoking, moderate drinking. Alcohol doesn't decrease your risk of colon cancer, so there's no reason to drink as a preventative thing, but if you drink excessively, that increases your risk. In colon cancer or just generally in like everything? Everything. <laughs> everything. When you're in the room um, and you're doing the screening and you see it, do you pretty much know right away like how much, what we're going to be, do our treatment? Well, when we, uh, when you've done enough colonoscopies and you've seen yeah. enough cancers, when you see a cancer, you pretty much know what you're dealing with is a cancer. You have no idea to um, estimate how aggressive it is okay. and how deep it is and has it traveled anywhere into the lymph nodes or into the liver. That's impossible. Okay. You would need further studies like a CAT scan x-ray of the abdomen to see that. Okay. But when you first look at a polyp, you can tell if it kind of has a sense of being cancerous or if you think it's going to be benign. Okay. When I saw yours, I thought, yikes, this is cancer. Really? But I what was, does it look like? It looks ugly. Yeah. It's ugly. Black? It's, it's not black. You think it's black, but it's not. It's not. It's, it's 
red and angry looking. Sometimes it's ulcerated and then as soon as you touch it, it feels very firm and it bleeds so easily. Mm -hmm. And just by the feel, you know you're dealing with badness. So you knew. You had that. Oh, I knew. I knew with yours, but I wasn't willing to say that until I got the pathology because that's not fair. That's not no, fair to tell a patient until they know 100% on black and white and yeah. they have it. And not only that, you're all messed up on the happy juice. So oh yeah, you're high as a kite. It would you're be a so huge buzzkill. <laughs> you would not enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, yeah, you don't, yeah, no, you don't want to go home with that. Okay, so I just want to take it from there. For me, she, she, she did my colonoscopy, which was a Wednesday. I recovered Thursday and Friday I called her. Friday afternoon, and she said, um, you need to come in. I go, okay, well, let me take my schedule for next week. And she's like, you need to go, you need to come in right now. And it's what I call my, your D-Day, that your D-Day, your diagnosis day, is like when she said that to me, and everybody has their own reaction, but I pretty much think it's all horrifying. Your heart stops, and I remember, I, I remember saying to her, am I going to die? And you said, no, I mean, eventually, but not like right now. <laughs> and then I said to her, do I have cancer? And you said, yes. And I'm like, okay. And I'll be, I'm like, I'll be right in. And I phoned and I made arrangements for my children. And I remember driving there and just going like, I have no idea where it is, how, you know, I, I, you're terrified. And I remember parking kind of like being in a dream sequence. Like you're not, you're not you're doing all these things, but you're you're really like kind of like in this this space of like oh just pure terror and it, it's it's an awful walk. I kept thinking dead men walking. That's what I kept thinking. Like, am I is she gonna tell me I'm gonna die? So then I got into the room and I actually phoned her on my anniversary, which was February 10th, to thank her because she sat me on the end of the bed and put her hands on my knees and she told me that I was going to be okay. Yeah. 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 That I remember that vividly. I remember that vividly. I mean, we laugh about it now, but those conversations that we have with our patients are extremely difficult. Yeah. I mean, every time we, you have to do it, every right? Every time. I mean, we leave that office. I mean, we, we have a straight face when we're talking to you, but when we leave that office, not easy. Yeah. Well, you were amazing. You were really amazing. I like want to thank you for that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I knew you were going to do well, and I'll tell you why. Because you have had and still have the most optimistic, happy <laughs> demeanor. And I said, if anyone's going to kick this, it's going to be you. Because Kicking you, cancer to the curb. That's right. Because seriously, you have the best attitude about this, and you're like, you know what? I have it. I have it but I'm going to kill it. I'm going to take yeah. it to the curb. Yeah. Yeah. And you were like, okay, bring it on. I am ready. Yeah. Bring it on. I am not going to let this take over my life. I have kids. I have a husband. Yeah. I have friends. I have Madonna tickets. I'm like, Madonna <laughs> tickets. You know, it, it, you, know it, you had determination to get through this and you did beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. My, very impressive. It was very impressive. Thank it you. warms my heart. Thank you. Well, you're very impressive too. Oh, thank you. I, I, I remember asking her two questions. This is total vanity on my part, and I know I've shared this with you before. <laughs> I asked her two questions. After she just told me I had cancer, confirmed it. I said, will my hair fall out? Like, that's important. And will I be able to still have ladies night? <laughs> Which is also like, that's where my head is. What am I going to look like? And what about my social life? And you said, your hair's not going to fall out. And you're going to still have ladies night. And she was right on both. Now, can you please explain why with colon cancer as opposed to uh, breast cancer, why does our hair not fall out? Why? The chemotherapy is different. Right. It's There's, a different cocktail. It's a different cocktail. There's different side effects to each medication. Right. And colon cancer is one that there are other side effects that you can, you know, explain much better than what I can with your personal experience. But hair loss is not one of them. Yeah, that's that's a kind of a bonus. That is a bonus, especially for my female patients, because it is hard to deal with the yeah the, the look. So that's not something you have to deal with. 
I'm sure I'm I'm sure at the beginning when they're losing their hair it's very difficult but when you're actually in the treatment you don't really care anymore you just want to get I mean you I was a mess I mean you just you you put your clothes on your most comfy clothes you get to your treatments and you come back it's what did I say to you I said this is gonna be a rough year yes you said it's gonna be one year it's gonna be really rough but you're gonna do it you can do this and you're gonna look back on this and you're gonna be like wow it's over and that's that's a hundred percent right on it is rocky one year it's not easy but you know people come out doing a-okay they really do no I know I can't believe it. I feel so good like I'm seeing you now after not seeing you for yeah. a while yeah uh, in the middle of your chemo and when things weren't going so <sighs> great yeah and you look back to your gorgeous self I mean when I first met you I mean yeah. it's it's so wonderful to see it, it just warms my heart it's it's amazing because you're when you're in it you don't even think it's ever gonna be over and you never sometimes you think you'll never get out of it and then like now I feel good again and you know I have my energy back but when you're in it you're just like is this ever gonna end it's a, a year is a long time and even though you say that it there there's nothing that you could actually prepare us for because it is really tough to get through that chemo. I reminded you of that a few times during your one year session. Yeah. And even though you knew it, it's hard to stomach it. It's hard to yeah. see the light at the end of the tunnel while you're in it. Yeah, you can't you cannot really verbalize it because it is so much more tough on your body and that's not for everyone they have different levels right. of chemo I saw people walking around there on chemo I'm like how come you're on chemo you look so much better than I and I feel so terrible and you and they would say oh well I have this chemo or I've had it for years I'm coming in here once a week like there's like different levels so not all chemo levels you I'm actually grateful that I had the opportunity to get chemo because and, and mine was so strong because I wanted to be gone forever yeah so every time I would start like complaining in my brain, I would say, you know what, you're blessed to have the chemo. This is knocking it out. Nothing is going to survive this in your body. So just be happy that you're getting it. And then I would be like, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the process. Is it pretty much the same? You get diagnosed, then you send us to a surgeon. We talk to the surgeon and then you get chemo, radiation, surgery, chemo is that kind of the process it depends on where the cancer is in the colon okay if the cancer is higher up then you don't have to undergo radiation oh. if it's lower down in the rectal area you have to undergo radiation to shrink it so the surgery is easier and more minimal and so when you say higher up like how much higher? so maybe on the right side or in the transverse colon which is the top portion or even on the left side but not so far down near the rectum it's an easier treatment. You okay. had the harder one. Right. But I was still lucky because it still could have been lower and that would have been worse. That would have been worse. That would have been worse. But you know all these badness things that we're talking about? Yeah. They're all treatable. It really yeah. is all treatable. Col they say that colon cancer is one of the most treatable diseases, correct? That's cancer right. disease. And even on the ones that have traveled to the liver already and they're not candidates for surgery, um, Still, their their life expectancy is much longer now than it's ever been before. That's so great. And it's because we have all these great chemotherapy drugs that keep you alive longer. Right. So, of all the cancers to have, this is this is not such a bad one to have right. because there's so much hope with it. Good. Okay. Remember that if you get diagnosed with this. Can you tell us the difference between a colostomy and an ileostomy? Because a lot of the times you will get a, a bag um, because you don't want anything passing through while you're, after your surgery and they've taken it out, they've taken the cancer out there and you're healing. They'll oftentimes give you a bag, which I experienced. But what is the difference between those two? The ileostomy, it's, basically it's where the cut is made. So a colostomy, the cut is made where the colon is bypassed, the ileostomy, it's where the ileum is cut. Okay. So technically, it's not that, that different. That different. Technically, you won't notice that much difference. It's more what the surgeon is doing. But right. from a patient's perspective, it's not that different. All right. Okay. 
Any words of wisdom, any advice for, for anybody going through this or, first of all, prevention, yeah. prevention, prevention. Be aware. I, be aware. Listen to your body. If your body is telling you something is wrong, you have change in bowel habits, you're having rectal bleeding, okay. you're losing weight, your stools have changed, bring it to your doctor's attention immediately because that's something that should be checked into. And if you're 50 and you don't have any symptoms, go ahead and get checked. It's only a test once every 10 years, so prevention wow. prevention is just the key. And then if we do find something in there, just remember, having a good outlook is gonna be what's gonna get you through A-OK, -okay. because once we find it and we know the evil in front of us, we go after it pretty aggressively. Oh yeah, they do. And <laughs> they do. We do, and then you come out A-OK. -okay. I was in, I was in treatment like ten days later. I was at getting ready. I was like, "There's no Whoa. messing around." No, no, no. It was like you're on the fast track to getting better, That's which right. is good. Yeah, you get that, you know, out of your body. There's no reason that needs to stay in there a minute longer. Yeah. And what do you love most about being a gastroenterologist? See how good I did that? Very good. <laughs> I'm impressed. Yes, thank you. It's fun. It's, it's just, fun. It, it's so fun. I mean, to think about when you take a bite of food and it goes into your mouth and it goes down your esophagus and the track it makes and how you absorb that and how you digest it and then being able to talk to patients and they tell you things that are wrong and then you get to go in with a scope and go and look and see are they right, are they wrong, what do we find in there. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of everything, a little bit of office, a little bit of procedures. It's just a fun practice to be in. That's so interesting because you're one of the very few female doctors, so I told you that when I was going through the list of options of doctors, I'm like, I want a female. If I'm going to be dealing with that part of my body, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter anymore because now, <laughs> now it's been researched, that part of my body, um, with several doctors, and, you know, and turds, whatever. Um, um, and can I, can I make yeah, a comment about that? Please. For us... I know, Doctors, I know. We could care less. I know. We could care less if we're looking in your mouth at a tooth or in your butt at a polyp. You know, for us it's the same. People are always so embarrassed. Is it really about it. though? And yes, it's exactly the same mm -hmm. for us. I, I could care less about looking at your finger at a hangnail and looking inside your ear for an infection or looking up your butt for cancer. To me, it's it's just part of your body. And right. that's how doctors look at it. And people are oftentimes so embarrassed to bring this topic up to their doctor because it's such a private area, but really from a physician perspective, it's all the same to us. It really is. Yeah. So don't be shy about talking about it. Like in GI, that's my favorite topic. I mean, I, I love talking about that kind of stuff. Well, with you, I was totally comfortable, but you were, after you, it was almost all men. And yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, oh man, and now, you know, my friends and I actually, it, it was, it was good in the sense that we could make a lot of jokes about it, and it, like, it was funny about my, you know, ASS cancer, and, you know, we would have fun with it, but, I mean, I would be like, oh, gosh, I gotta do this again, and you're, you feel humiliated, but that eventually does go away, and you, you, you know, then you understand that you're dealing with something bigger than your modesty. Right. And you don't, you don't even care, and then once you're going through chemo, and you're really, really sleep, I mean, you just don't even care. You just want to get better. Definitely. Uh, you're with the Cedars Group. Right, the Cedars Sinai Medical Group. Right, you you can find her. She's a great doctor. I recommend her. I believe oh, I was sent to you. you. I do, because I was looking. And I think I had called somebody before you, but for some reason it, it didn't work out. So I really believe that I was supposed to be in your care. Like, I believe that. I believe that with all of the doctors, because I've only had good experiences with my doctors. Amazing. Thank you. But you know, we're pretty lucky at Cedars. Cedars has a great group Excellent. of docs. Oh yeah. Right? Oh yeah. It's a very strong group. But we're also lucky living in LA. We have so many great hospitals yes. at our fingertips. There's nowhere else that I would want to be treated than in LA. Really. Like that's I can see that, but you know what? There's good GIs all over the place. Of course. I know, but you you just it's so easy with especially with uh Cedars being so compact, you know, and I can go from Wilshire all the way down and go, there's that doctor, there's that doctor, there's that doctor. Like, they're all like on Wilshire Boulevard. I have like six to, and even my kids will be, oh, mom, there's that doctor, there's that doctor. And we'll laugh because, but it's true. They're like, it, it's easy to get around and it, you feel that sense of community. You know, everybody's working together for you. 
Yeah. You 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 really feel like uh, special. Well, I can tell you many times at our meetings, I'll say, "Hey, you know, how is this patient doing? And how is this patient doing?" And we talk about our patients. Yeah. You know, at social gatherings. Yeah. Just to say, you know, how are they doing? Are they doing okay? Because we genuinely care. We really want you to get better, and we want things to be okay. And you know, like I said, in front of you, we're solid, and you know, everything is professional. But right. When we leave, I mean, our heart is with you. Yeah. It really yeah. is. Well, you can tell them I'm doing great. You are doing great. And that makes me <laughs> thrilled. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You. My pleasure. All right. All you need to know right here, Dr. Raina Olson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me.